coming up on the November 3rd edition of Sports Extra. The Carolina football team had a great chance to position itself in the Coastal Division, and it's gone. We go over what went wrong in Miami. It isn't just about varsity sports at Carolina. We take a look at a couple diverse club sports programs on campus. And please don't stop. Please don't stop the music. Carolina athletes love their music. We look at how it gets them going on game day. All that and more, Sports Extra starts right now. From the University of North Carolina School of Journalism and Mass Communication, covering the full range of Tar Heel athletics, this is Sports Extra. I hope everyone had a great Halloween. Welcome to the November 3rd edition of Sports Extra. I'm Alana Albrecht. And I'm Susanna Black. For a lot of fall sports, November means postseason play. So even with the cold temps, things will be heating up. But before the on-field excitement gets started, the Weinstein saga continues. Faculty and staff were able to get their input on the situation at the faculty council meeting last Friday. It was the first meeting of the faculty council since the release of the Weinstein report, which showed that faculty members, administrators, and staff missed or ignored red flags for years. Professors expressed disappointment about how the university handled the scandal, offered solutions for how to fix the problems once and for all, and said UNC should formally apologize to whistleblower Mary Willingham. Joining us now is Associate Professor Dr. Louis Margolis. Dr. Margolis, thanks for being here. You're welcome. What was the feel of the meeting on Friday? The feel of the meeting, uh, I think that there was a, a great deal of uh, a great deal of interest, a great deal of anger, uh, and curiosity about trying to learn more about how the university ended up in this situation. Okay, what are your thoughts about the scandal and the Weinstein report? Well, I, I think the uh, the report demonstrates that there was a fundamental violation of the integrity of the university, totally unacceptable. For me personally, it uh, raises the question yet again of whether it is possible to engage in big time competitive revenue sports in a university and still adhere to the primary academic mission of that university. Do you think it's possible? Personally, I do not think it's possible. I think that we end up making compromises when it comes to the revenue sports so that the, the academic mission suffers. I think we have other mechanisms whereby, to, uh, whereby we can provide uh, training and uh, development for athletes, that is, we have professional leagues. And I don't think that it is useful for universities to take on that additional function. Okay. Do you think the university owes Mary Willingham an apology? I think there's no question that the university owes Mary Willingham a, an apology. Uh, she raised this question about how athletes some athletes were able to progress academically. Uh, she worked closely with athletes for a number of years. And at, at a minimum, I think we should have had university leadership saying, Mary, you're raising important points. Come and talk to us. Tell us what we need to know. Tell us what we need to do to get to, bod to, to, get to the bottom of this problem. OK. Dr. Lewis Margolis, thank you so much for being here. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. In the wake of the Weinstein report, we've heard little from current student athletes, but now some student athletes are getting a chance to express themselves through the UNC Theater Department. Kayla Gibson reports. In the midst of the athletic scandal, we've heard from many voices, from school leaders to academic advisors to former athletes. The voice of current student athletes has largely gone unheard. But there is one medium that is giving student athletes a voice, the theater. Now there's more to us than just playing on Saturdays. David Navalinsky teaches Drama 160, a class with a historically high number of athletes. The more I got to talk with these students and the more of the, that these students came to office hours, um, I realized how much it was affecting them. That's when Navalinsky, along with former drama student Ellie Everts and senior Jackson Bloom, decided to create the play Priceless Gem, an athlete story. They interviewed 30 UNC student athletes from 16 different sports and put them together to give student athletes a voice, but under the veil of anonymity. We wanted them to feel 
like they had the freedom to really speak their mind and really say what they were feeling without being worried about any repercussions. And what they discovered was that they're not much different than the average student. We're regular students through and through. I can tell you this, I wouldn't be here if I didn't want to learn. But with the stresses of how outsiders see them. How everyone's like, oh, so that's why Carolina such a had such a great game because it's so easy. But they're still glad they chose to be Tar Heels. Like, I still feel grateful to be a student athlete at North Carolina. And I feel like that's how most people feel too. They were so excited to, to hear that voice and felt that it was a very good representation uh, of their collective voice. Now Navalinsky says all the play needs is more fine tuning before a final performance can be made of the piece. In Chapel Hill, I'm Kayla Gibson Therefore, reporting. It can take a long time to put a play together. Organizers hope many more athletes will be able to contribute to the project. Now let's move on to what some of those athletes have done on the field. Carolina football went to Miami, tied for third in the ACC Coastal Conference. Instead of creeping closer to Duke and Miami at the top, the Heels took a stumble toward the bottom. After just one quarter, it was a defensive struggle. Miami led 7-0. Then a safety after this snap goes over the head of punter Tommy Hibbert. 9-0 Miami. Carolina scored on defense after this fumble return by Casey Collins, but then the floodgates opened. 35 unanswered points by the Hurricanes, including this 90-yard run by running back Duke Johnson. Marquise Williams ran the ball in for a touchdown twice late in the game. Final score, 47-20 Miami. Football analyst Luis Fernandez joins us now to break down the Carolina loss. Luis, there was a lot of momentum going into this game. What happened? Well, Atlanta, the offense wasn't able to throw up points like it has all season long. Miami is one of the best defenses in the ACC, and the Canes, they came to play. Carolina had six yards on the ground. Nope, that's not a mistake. Six yards, .2 yards per carry. Now, to be fair, they lost, the lost yards from the bad snaps came from rushing, but even so, that's only 61 yards for the game. And what happens when you make a team one-dimensional? You can throw everything and the kitchen sink at the quarterback. Miami sacked Marquise Williams seven times, seven times. Granted, he can hold onto the ball a little too long, trying to make a play, but still. UNC's offense struggles like this, it's not something we're used to seeing. In fact, it's not something head coach Larry Fedora has seen before. That brings us to this week's hidden stat. 258 yards are the fewest a Larry Fedora coached offense has ever put up. That includes three seasons at Southern Miss and two and a half seasons at Carolina. In the first half, there was no offensive drive longer than 20 yards. And the two bad snaps on punts lost Carolina 33 yards overall, like we mentioned before. Now, speaking of those snaps, we have to take a second to talk about the special teams. You know, there was this bad snap on the punt that led to the safety, just goes right over his head. And then there was the bad snap on this punt that ultimately led to this short one yard rushing touchdown by Miami. And then Nick Weiler missed this extra point. Let's take a second and watch this. There's nothing for me really to say after that wide left. Fans often take a good kicker for granted, but when one is struggling, everyone notices. So in total, that's a 10 point swing from special teams alone. Now, even with those points, Carolina would have come up short. The defense gave up a lot of points, so I'm going to break down two touchdowns in particular. Miami quarterback Brad Kea takes full advantage of the play action in the second quarter on this play. If we see here, he freezes the linebacker with the play action, giving the tight end Clive Walford some time to work, some room to work with in the middle on this slant. Walford doesn't run the greatest route, sure. Uh, he rounds out a little bit, but you know, uh, six four tight end and six foot safety happens. Now we go to the Duke Johnson running play here. That was a real backbreaker. If we look right here. There's a huge gap in the middle right here for him to run through. The linemen are able to get to the second level. The wide receivers have a great block, and all Duke Johnson has to really do is just hit that hole and outrun everyone. He is a good player, so Carolina shouldn't be too, feel too bad about that. Now, while these definitely aren't great plays, there's more to the defense's poor performance during the past three years under, under head coach Larry Fedora. First, the academic probation from 2012. You have to remember that Carolina lost 15 scholarships. That means that there were fewer players with scholarship level talent. So from a defensive standpoint, that means less depth. Fedora's offensive style doesn't help either. He's so fast paced with it, it a lot of times makes the defense stay on the field more than they're used to, tiring them out and bringing out players who might not be as talented or ready to play at the college level. 
Now either way, Atlanta, if UNC wants to go to its second straight bowl, the Heels will have to win two of their last three games. That includes a Pitt team that just took a ranked Duke team that double overtime, a strong Duke team, and an NC State team that has struggled, but I have a feeling they would be highly motivated to shut Carolina out of the postseason. No doubt about that, Lewis. Carolina will have a long time to think about it. The Heels have their second bye of the season. Football analyst Lewis Fernandez, thanks so much. Even more bad news for the Tar Heels. The Durham Herald Sun is reporting that police charged starting running back Romar Morris early Sunday morning with impaired DWI, a misdemeanor. He's scheduled to appear in court on November 13th. A school per spokesperson said the team is aware of the incident, but had no immediate comment. Morris is a senior. The success of the team has a bearing on how much Tar Heel gear local shops sell. Our Amanda Lee is live at Chapel Hill Sportswear on Franklin Street to look into how the university benefits from those sales. Thanks, Susanna. Here at Chapel Hill Sportswear, the entire second story of the store is known as the Nike shop. Up here, Tar Heel fans can find all kinds of Nike gear, including their favorite jerseys. I took a look at how the university uses the proceeds from those jersey sales. Her store has the largest jersey selection on Franklin Street, but Holly Dedman, the manager of Chapel Hill Sportswear, says jersey sales are only a small percentage of their business, partially because of the high prices. So we have $120 jerseys upstairs. That's not just an impulse buy. That's, you have to think about that. You have to really want that jersey to spend $120 on it. Portions of the proceeds from UNC Apparel sold by Chapel Hill Sportswear and other vendors goes back to the university in the form of royalties. These funds go to the Office of Scholarships and Student Aid and are used exclusively for non-athletic needs. Uh, typically many times 100% of the proceeds from royalties will go to fund the athletic department. Uh, at other places sometimes it's a 50-50 split. Uh, as far as I know, I think we're the only one, uh, and if we're not, we're one of the very few uh, where 100% of those proceeds go to non-athletic needs. Steinbacher says 75% of royalty proceeds go to need-based scholarships, and the remaining 25% goes to merit-based scholarships. He also says in the past four years, the university has averaged $4.5 million in total royalties. Uh, we do about $150,000 a year in terms of royalties from Jersey sales, so that's really just 3% of the total royalties. Every fiscal quarter, the Collegiate Licensing Company ranks the top-selling institutions and manufacturers based on revenue from royalties. For the 2013-2014 third quarter, UNC was ranked 14th. For local licensees, Chapel Hill Sportswear ranked 13th. This season, the number three jersey for Ryan Switzer and the number eight jersey for TJ Logan are on sale for the football team. Next week, we'll take a look at how these jersey numbers were selected and how those players feel about it. Back to you, Susanna. And we'll be looking forward to it, Amanda, live at Chapel Hill Sportswear. Thank you. The women cross country team had a history making weekend, winning its first conference title in more than a decade. The Lady Heels were seated third, but that didn't stop them from beating personal records and taking the conference title. Senior Ann Lee Hardy was fourth overall with a personal best of 2009.5, earning all ACC honors. Senior Leanne Farber wasn't far behind with a seventh place finish. The Tar Heel men also finished strong, taking third in the ACCs with all five scoring runners setting personal records. Senior Ryan Walling finished 10th overall. It was another overtime for the Heels, but this one ended in a draw. Why they should have won, next on Sports Extra. Connect with us online by liking the Sports Extra Facebook page and following us on Twitter, at Sports Extra underscore UNC. <gasps> Staring contest! Got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. Visit discovertheforest.org to find a forest near you. Yeah. 
The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. No more pencils, no more books. No more teachers, dirty looks. School's out for summer. What this place needed was better graduation rates. So we worked with schools like Henry Ford High, and now they're up 18%. To help us do more good this year, go to unitedway.org, because great things happen when we live united. The number three men's soccer tied number 21 Virginia 1-1 in double overtime Friday to end the regular season. Jonathan Campbell's shot deflected off senior Tyler Engel for Carolina's lone goal. The goal was Engel's fifth of the season. UVA got the equalizer when this shot bounced off Campbell's head and pass keeper Brendan Moore. Carolina is the third seed in the upcoming ACC tourney. And the women's soccer team traveled to Chile Syracuse Sunday to wrap up its season as well. The game went to overtime. Paige Nielsen scored the golden goal early in the first extra frame. The victory sealed the ACC regular season title for UNC, its first since 2010, and the 21st in program history. The Tar Heels will see their next action in the ACC tournament. The ninth-ranked volleyball team blew past the Miami Hurricanes for its seventh sweep of the season. Outside hitter Lee Andrew was on fire, putting up 16 points, helping the Tar Heels breeze through the first two sets. Miami found its footing early in the third set, though, taking advantage of service errors and sloppy plays from UNC. Despite the late surge, a blocking error from Miami gave UNC its ninth consecutive victory of the season. The number one ranked Tar Heel field hockey team played its season finale Sunday as the Heels traveled to face number 17 Old Dominion. Carolina struggled early against the Big Blue, facing a 1-0 halftime deficit. The Heels rallied for five consecutive goals in the second half, including doubles from juniors Emma Bozak and Casey DiNardo. After the 5-1 win, UNC will make its next appearance in the ACC tournament. The UNC baseball program continues to recruit and produce top products. Ranked as one of, a, of Baseball America's top assistant coaches, Scott Jackson seems to have the right approach both at the plate and on the recruiting trail. Tate Frazier reports. For the past five seasons, he's been the first one to offer a congratulatory handshake on first base. And he's the one responsible for recruiting and molding every Tar Heel that comes through the program. Um, you want that to be a part of uh, a young man's decision when he chooses a school as a tradition and development and all the things that we feel like are important um, for the kids that want to choose our program. As the primary contact for potential top UNC targets, Jackson has locked up five consecutive top 10 recruiting classes dating back to his first season in Chapel Hill. One of the biggest commitments during this period came from a standout outfielder from the Peach State. The right fielder, number 20, Sky Bolt. He's got a magic wand. I don't know. He uh, he's got a way of making making guys like him, and it's not a it's not a false set. Jackson also works wonders as the hitting coach for the Tar Heels. UNC continues to build a reputation for preparing players for the big leagues by teaching one key point. We focus on um, understanding the strike zone. It might sound like a simple concept, but it's a major component in determining success at the next level. The things that you can't see, how hard they want to work, uh, how committed they are, uh, the things that we talk about in our program that kind of follow them um, along with their talent that end up separating them and getting them to the big leagues. Bolt's eligible for the MLB draft as a junior, and it's not the first time Jackson's had a talented performer looking to make the jump early. In Chapel Hill, I'm Tate Frazier reporting. Baseball America projects Bolt to be a top 30 draft pick in the 2015 MLB draft. Coming up on Sports Extra. We give you VIP access into some of the most exciting sports clubs on campus. If you 
store your guns properly. I'll feel safer when I'm playing outside. Safer when walking home. I won't have to tell so many family members. I'm sorry. I won't hear as many scary stories. And I won't have to tell my kids. This isn't a drill. Please. Please, do it for us. Your family, friends, and neighbors are all counting on you. Never let your gun get into the wrong hands. Remember, always lock it up. Visit ncpc.org. Hart, what's going on? I'm leaving. Why? What did I do? Not enough. You constantly ignore me. You barely eat anything healthy. You're half as active as you used to be. The pressure is just too much. I quit. OK, I get it. I'll do better. Just please. Don't leave. OK. But remember, if I go, you go. Listen to your heart. Don't let it quit on you. Uncontrolled high blood pressure could lead to stroke, heart attack, or death. Get yours to a healthy range before it's too late. All right, honey. Here's an inside look at a couple of club sports on campus. First up, women's rugby. While the team has excelled on the field, it's what these athletes do off it that makes them unique. Luis Lagar has more. The UNC Women's Rugby Club started in 1993 and has become one of the premier women's rugby programs in the South. But it's not all about sports for these athletes. Philanthropy co-chair Katie Petrie says the team is committed to helping the community. But over time, we decided that it was a position we wanted for the club, just so we could have the opportunity to give back to the community. Carolina Women's Rugby collaborates with Farmer Future, a collective of farmers and shoppers from the Carbo Farmers Market. Its objective is to provide fresh local food to a local hunger relief agency. Um, well, Farmer Future is actually uh, an idea from several of our teammates. One of us um, was involved with it over the summer and she really liked it. So we just kind of continued with it and we know that's a really good uh, organization in the community. Um, they give back to a lot of groups that really need it. We work with the farmers, so we um, stimulate the economy of the farmers um, and their produce while still being able to give food to the community. So we accept cash donations um, and we also accept food donations. Carolina Women's Rugby see it as an ideal way to give back. I think it's really awesome being part of the community and being able to um, help support things like locally grown foods and like helping lower income families provide for their families. It just like makes us feel more in touch with the community and like we're uh, serving a purpose and helping out too. So like we get a lot from Carolina, so it feels good to like give back. In Chapel Hill, I'm Luis Legarre reporting. The Carborough Farmers Market will have a special pre-Thanksgiving market day on Tuesday, November 25th. If you still need to make some last minute purchases. UNC saw its women's tennis team travel down to Tallahassee for an event this weekend. Members of the women's team participated in the USTA Collegiate Clay Court Invitational at Florida State this weekend. Carolina sent Marika Ackerman and Cassandra Vazquez to the tournament. The two competed in singles and teamed up for the doubles tournament, where they fell in the second round. UNC fencing traveled to Temple University for the Temple Intercollegiate Open. The women's Caroline, the Carolina's Eli Moreno finished in the top 10 in Epi. Amanda Lazarian finished in the top 20 in foil, and Jillian Latinsky finished second overall in Sabre. The Tar Heel men dominated in Epe and Sabre, seeing two members finish in the top five of each event. Our second part of our club sports series features the club gymnastics team, where you don't have to be an Olympian to go for gold. Morgan Ammons has more. Want to learn how to do backflips or already know how to do them? The UNC club gymnastics team welcomes people at all levels of proficiency to join the team. The club's president, Caitlin Townsend, says the club is about more than just gymnastics. It's a lot of fun and honestly, it's as much about the people in our club, like we have a really great group, as it is about the gymnastics. The club team is very different from the varsity gymnastics team. It's more of kind of just for fun with club gymnastics, so we accept anyone. You can literally come to us if you've never done a forward roll and we'll teach you how to do it. Last year, the team made school history by qualifying for team finals at the national competition. We won our session, we beat NC State, we beat everyone in our session and we went on to team finals. And when I got that news, it was just the happiest day of my life. Senior Delani Davis was on that team and said she loves the bonds she's formed with her teammates. 
it's just like everyone's so supportive. We have so much fun, especially traveling. We get like really close and become like a family. Defying gravity is her favorite part of the sport. You're doing the impossible. So like when people see us doing skills, they're like, oh my gosh, how does that, how do you do that? Like, how is that possible type thing? And like just the whole wow factor is really cool that I'm able to do those things. And you too can learn to do the impossible by joining the club gymnastics team, which practices Tuesday and Thursday evenings in Fetzer Gym C. In Chapel Hill, I'm Morgan Ammons reporting. The team is traveling to Virginia Tech this weekend to compete in the Hokie Classic. The UNC rowing team was supposed to race this weekend, but Mother Nature had something else in mind. Organizers canceled the head of Chattahoochee Regatta in Chattanooga, Tennessee because of bad weather. It was the last competition of the fall. It doesn't matter who you are. When you hear that perfect beat, you just can't control yourself. Coming up on Sports Extra, we find out what makes UNC athletes get into rhythm on game day. Don't forget to tune into our sister shows, Carolina Week at 5 p.m. every Wednesday on Time Warner 24 or Campus Channel 34, and Carolina Connection at 8.30 every Saturday morning on WCHL 97.9 FM. Ah, the great outside. My new mom and I have a lot in common. So shiny. We both love the outdoors. That's not a flower. And she knows a lot about wildlife. <gasps> a labradoodle. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. You wouldn't let money just blow out of your house. So when your AC or heater is on, make sure the doors, windows, and fireplace flue are shut tight. If you're headed out, turn down the AC or lower the heat by 10 degrees. And always keep your water heater set at 120. A little bit of common sense goes a long way. Get more great tips at energysaver.gov. What kind of music have you been listening to lately? Um, well, recently I have been listening to a lot of Drake, actually. What about you? I listen to everything. As long as it's good, it's got a good beat, I like it. Music can really inspire, bring people together, and pump up an athlete. Our Brian McIntosh reports. The secret for some of the world's most elite athletes isn't their diet or training methods, but what they're listening to. Many athletes say the right song while training can make all the difference at game time. So which artists and songs are getting your favorite Tar Heels game day ready? I listen to J. Cole, the warm-up. Uh, you know, I, I'm more of a guy that's into hip-hop, like with meaning, or, and I like listening to the lyrics. I, I'm not a huge, you know, Migos or anything, uh, Young Thug or anything like that. What are some of the go-to tracks for these guys? Well, my favorite song to listen to before a game is DJ Yola. Uh, never let up. Never let up. I'm okay. talking about I, I can go in and listen to that about 30 times and be hyped for a game. That, that's what really gets me going. My favorite song really is Survivor. So whenever I get on or right before a race if, or if I'm up in the locker room, I like to listen to that. So it makes me want to go all out. It makes me want to give it my all. You're probably wondering what about David's song gets him so hyped. Only he can explain it best. I just feel like, you know, I can't never let up, you know, I, that's, I mean, the, the theme of the song, man, it's just like, dang, that's my life. But apparently both Corey and Davis have teammates that love to listen to a pretty popular artist that you've heard of. So it's like to listen to Miley Cyrus, him and Queese. Miley Cyrus. Him and, him and Queese like to listen to Miley Cyrus. Say Miley Cyrus, low key, like, my, my teammates are crazy. So why is there such a correlation between athletes and artists? We go off the same energy, you know, and I think it's the energy we want to convey, whether it's in our race or whether we're trying to convey it to an audience like artists. So I think that's something that we can definitely relate to. So next time you see your Tar Heels making a great play, just know they're probably playing to the same beat as you. In Chapel Hill, I'm Brian McIntosh reporting. You know, Alana, I think that's really interesting to see the different types of music that the different athletes like to listen to before games. Yeah, it looked like uh, Drake was up there, um, so we should maybe start listening too. Get us pumped up for the show. Yeah. Yeah. That does it for this edition of Sports Extra. Thanks for watching. Good night.